I actually did it. I didn't think I could pull it off, but I did, and it's really friggin' awesome. Hey guys, welcome back to Black Magic Craft. As I'm sure you can imagine, I receive a lot of build requests, sometimes dozens in a day. And I kind of universally ignore all of them because I just build what I want to build. But every once in a while, one of them does get my attention. And one of the ones that really got my attention was this really cool idea from one of my Patreon supporters, Belinda from Melbourne, Australia. She sent me this, this amazing idea. This concept was so cool that I just had to do it. It was dripping with narrative and story and inspiration. I just, I really, really loved it and I knew I had to build it. And because Belinda has been such a long time Patreon supporter, I figured if I was gonna do a request, this would be the one to do. I'm gonna be honest, I was intimidated to do this build. The idea is simple enough. The embellishments are simple enough, but the actual shape was a little bit intimidating. This thing, this hull of this ship is full of like compound curves. And to be honest, I wasn't sure how the heck I was gonna do it out of foam. So I avoided it for months and months and months, but I decided it was finally time to step up and get it done. And I did. And you know what? It was challenging. It was a little bit difficult to get this to a certain point, but I stuck with it and I did it and I pulled it off. And honestly, this is, in my opinion, one of the coolest things I've ever built on this channel. And I'm really, proud of it. So let me show you how I actually went about building this thing. The biggest challenge of this project was making the basic shape of the ship hull. I needed a skeleton of sorts that had all the right looking curves on it. I cut out some general shapes with construction paper to use as a guide to cut my foam core pieces. I had one for the face, one for the bottom, and one for the keel. I would also need ones that would work as like bulkheads that ran up the heel to reduce the curve towards the peak. I don't know what all the correct angles and proportions should be for this sort of thing. And frankly, I don't really care. I just wanted something that would look okay to me. And well, I think I pulled that off. Some of you may be wanting me to release these pieces as a template, but I'm not going to do that for two reasons. I think it's more beneficial for you to try and work through a project like this yourself, as that's the best way to build your skills. But also because I cut up one of my paper guides and reduced it in size for each increment of the bulkhead, meaning it's forever lost. And I, like you, will need to recreate it from scratch if I were to attempt this again. For each layer, I used a one inch spacer of foam. I held the guide from the last layer in place, marked where it met the frame on each side and simply reduced its size following the same outline shape. When I got to the very peak, I wanted a more solid chunk to glue my planks to, so I attached some half inch foam and simply carved it to shape using a handheld hot wire cutter. I made a keel piece out of XPS foam that I cut with my Proxon and then carved with an X-Acto to look more like wood. I used my usual wire brush technique to create wood grain, as I would do for all the planks on this project. The keel was then attached to the spine of my frame. Before adding the hull planking, I made some thicker and wider strips that would act like the deck's railing. This would also give me a place to terminate both the hull planking and the deck planking later. 
With my borders in place, I got to work making all of the planks for the hull. I made these thicker than I would if I was gluing them to a flat surface because they needed to be strong enough to bridge the gap between each layer of my frame. Actually attaching them proved to be quite difficult. I used hot glue and pins to hold things in place until the glue cooled. My frame didn't leave me much of a surface to bond to, and this made it very challenging to hold the foam in place as it was under stress from bending. In the future, I would probably double the number of layers I have on my frame in order to make this part easier. Once it was done, I was left with some pretty unsightly gaps between some of the planks. I was also a bit concerned about their strength. I decided to try something new to correct this. Using some Liquitex modeling paste, I filled all the gaps. This was a better choice than something like joint compound as it would remain flexible and would not be brittle once dried. I ended up deciding to coat all of the foam with this stuff in the hopes it would really strengthen the piece without losing too much of the wood grain detail. It was a bit of a gamble, but in the end it paid off as it made the piece super strong without sacrificing much detail. I suspect you could also use paintable acrylic caulking the same way, the trick is to use a a wet brush to remove all the excess. Before decorating the face of the building, I first needed a door as that is the point you always want to start with on the face of a building. I created a quick wood door out of XPS foam. Now I'm not much for measurement or scale, but one general guide I use are doors that measure one inch wide by one and a half inches tall. This creates an appropriate size door for 28 millimeter minis and the rest of the building details can then be visually estimated based off the size of the door. For the handle, I made use of some UV resin and a door handle mold that I had made previously. Within seconds, I had a usable door handle. I did quickly spray prime the resin before attaching it to the foam. I attached the door to the ship deck face a little high up as I wanted to create a step in front of it. I then added the trim to the door and I picked out some windows to use. On this project, I made use of these MDF windows from shiftinglands.com. They are absolutely perfect for a project like this. I used my chosen window to lay out the frame, but I didn't glue the window in place. I set it aside for later. For the deck planking, I cut two thin squares of XPS, making sure they were slightly different in thickness. Then I added wood grain and freehand cut planks of various widths. Mixing the two thicknesses of foam creates raised and lowered portions of wood, which adds a lot of dimension to the piece, and I attached them using tacky glue. I created some individual foam bricks to decorate the front step. This ended up being a bit of a waste of time because of the changes I would immediately make, but hey, that's the nature of creation. It was at this point I realized my problem. My front step looked odd. It was too high. It really needed a lower step or deck to make it look right. I decided to glue the entire building to a piece of chipboard. This would let me add some wood planks to the front, making a lower wood step. But as soon as I did this, I hated it. The chipboard was just too thick. I didn't like that it raised everything up off the table and that you could see it. This simply would not do. So I pulled the whole thing apart and decided to try again using instead some regular construction paper. This was thin enough to not be visible and it allowed me to attach my lower planking. All right, hold up a second. I know exactly what you're thinking. I can hear the pitter patter of your keyboard all the way up here. Why am I going through all of this effort and trouble about getting a really thin base thing on this? Why didn't I just leave the chipboard and cut it big and then make a decorative base? Because 
That's what you do with tabletop terrain. That's what a lot of people do. Why didn't I do that? It's because I don't like that approach. It is not for me. It works very well at creating a stable, secure, protective base for terrain. Absolutely, 100%. But you have to decorate that base and you gotta choose to put some sand on it or some grass or whatever. You have to actually do something to it and then your piece is stuck in that little world. If I surround this by a sandy base, then it's gonna look really odd if I put it on like a kind of more grassy tile. If I surround this thing in flocking or static grass, well, what if I wanna place this on an iceberg? What if I want this hut to exist in game in like the frozen north on an iceberg floating through the ocean. That would be a pretty cool use for this. If I had grass on it, it would look ridiculous. So that's why often I go through all this kind of extra effort and difficulty to avoid having a base on my pieces and definitely makes things harder, but it is an artistic choice for me. It's the way I like it, which is ironic. I realize the irony because when it comes to miniatures, I take the exact opposite approach. I absolutely take my minis and decorate them with flocking or sand or whatever that looks silly in different settings, but hey man, there's no rhyme or reason and no accounting for taste. It's just the way I like to do things. Unfortunately, it immediately caused another problem. The whole front step area would just be a floppy mess. Construction paper, simply isn't rigid enough, nor is the foam or the combination of both of those things. I had to think of a quick solution that would allow me to retain all of the work I had already done. I needed something to stop this area from bending. I decided to cut some big chunks of half inch foam that I could place on top across the planking to add some strength. These chunks could become part of the build in a functional and decorative way by turning them into flower planters. These types of solutions are what I love about these builds and exactly why I like working free form. It was at this moment, the little shack in my head was no longer being imagined as a fishing shack, but more as a proper little home that someone lived in, perhaps a merchant that sold their wares to the sea travelers who came to shore. With the build portion complete, I moved on to my Mod Podge coating before painting. When applying Mod Podge to wood grain details, I do not thin my mixture. I simply work with a wet brush and make sure I brush away any excess and brush with the grain when possible. While that dried, I started thinking about fun little details to add to the shack. One thing that came to mind was an overhang above the door made from some sort of animal pelt. I cut a little rectangle of chipboard and covered it with glue soaked toilet paper. I textured it a bit with my wire brush and created a bend at the back by propping it against my glue bottle. Then I put it aside to dry. Once it was dry, I cut away the excess toilet paper and created some support pieces out of bamboo skewers. I didn't really like how square this thing looked and how sharp the corners were, so I decided to carve it into a more natural shape. This meant I needed to add another layer of toilet paper to cover the edges that I had just carved. The second time around, however, this thing was looking much better. Now for the paint. When I paint wood, I like to do so with a golden brown that has been very watered down over black. This combination once dried creates a great basis for weathered wood. This time around, I decided to use a khaki color instead in the hopes that it would look more like driftwood, which I thought would better suit the theme of the project. I decided to paint the windows using the golden brown, however, as I wanted them to be distinctly different wood than the rest of it, so it didn't look like they came from the original shipwreck that this little cottage was built from. The ship also received a dry brushing of a very light tan to start to bring out some of the wood grain details. This was then followed by an application of my homemade washes. I did a mix of brown and black washes to try and introduce a bit of variety into the tones of the wood. For the overhang, I wanted it to look like a seal pelt. 
So I used my airbrush and I painted it in a few tones of beiges and grays, trying to create a pattern that radiated out from the center, becoming lighter towards the edges. I used a brush to add some small dots using a dark brown ink. It didn't turn out perfect, but it turned out pretty decent for the first time trying something like this. Once my wash was dry, I went back over it with another light tan dry brushing. This time I was very careful to keep this incredibly minimal. I used a big soft makeup brush from the dollar store here. These things are fantastic for this purpose. At this point, I started thinking about the windows again. I wanted to try something new here. There are so many ways to approach windows and I'm still trying to find the method that I like best. My idea was to paint out the window areas as if they were glowing from candlelight. Then I could put the windows back in place and hopefully create a nice effect. To do this, my windows needed glass. I again used the UV resin from greenstuffworld.com that I had reviewed in a previous video. I'm absolutely in love with this stuff for quick effects. Within seconds, I had cured resin and I could keep working. But I didn't quite like how my lighting effect looked. I thought it was too subtle, too beige. So I started it all over again, this time going with a much brighter orange. For the round window, I just glued it directly to the piece of paper that I had been using to test my spray. I can't say I love the final results of the color, it doesn't really look right, but I think the idea is good, it's just a matter of getting the paint behind them right. At first I had glued the round window right to the surface of the wood, but I thought it looked kind of funny standing proud like that, so I carefully cut out the foam so I could recess the window, which made it look way way better. Now back to the pelt. I sprayed it with gloss varnish so that I could add a brown wash. I really wanted the wash to get into the crevices, but I didn't want it to soak in and darken the whole thing, and the clear coat made this possible. After that, it was just a matter of super gluing it in place. Overall, this piece was looking a bit too uniform. I went back in with some Citadel washes and created some streaks and dark spots to give everything more variety, but most importantly, more depth. I paid extra attention to darken the areas that should have some shadow. I used some Vallejo texture paste to fill the planters with what would look like soil. Using a variety of static grass and flower tufts, I filled the planters using the Vallejo paste to act as the adhesive. This little cottage needed a few more embellishments, so I got to work sculpting. I wanted to be true to Belinda's original sketch, so I made some tusks out of green stuff to decorate the peak. I also created a little strand of, well, I didn't quite know what at the time. I wanted something to hang by the door to look like maybe, I don't know, a string of garlic. I used some steel thread and green stuff to create this. In the end, I painted it up to look like coral and it ended up being one of my favorite parts of the build. Adding these little details is always the most satisfying thing after a challenging build. With the tusks, I did take a liberty with the original sketch and mounted them down instead of up as I found they sat nicer on the build this way, especially with the addition of the window. This was by far one of the most challenging projects I've ever attempted on this channel, both in terms of building it and in terms of capturing it for video. The first half of it really was not simple, but it sure did pay off and I'm sure glad that I did it. While I hope you found this video and project entertaining and inspiring, the real takeaway I'd like you to have is that even for someone like me that builds stuff a lot, some projects can be straight up intimidating, but it's important to dive into them head first because it's those types of projects that will challenge you and increase your skills more than anything else. Most importantly, they will grow your confidence as a builder. If you enjoyed this video, hit the like button, let me know in the comments section, 
And if you want to grab some tools or supplies for your own projects and help this channel out in the process, consider doing your shopping via my essential equipment page on blackmagiccraft.ca. The great thing about shopping that way is that you get info and links to all of the right stuff that I actually use, and I earn some revenue in the process by you using those links. It doesn't cost you anything extra, and it helps to fund the production of these videos. It's a win-win for everybody. Another great way you can help fund these videos is by supporting the channel on Patreon. That support is hugely impactful to me and this channel, and it really means a lot when people join. If you want any feedback or help from me on your own projects, the only real way to make that happen these days is by joining the fellowship group via Patreon. I just receive too many messages every day to respond to them all, so I prioritize helping my Patreon family and I'd really like to have you as the newest member. That's it for this one, guys. Thanks for watching. Have a great weekend. I'll see you next week.